Good afternoon. It's Friday the 14th of August uh, 2015, just after one o'clock. Welcome to UK Column News. I'm your host this afternoon, Brian Gerrish. With me in the studio, a selection of people, including David Scott from Northern Exposure. Hello, David. Very glad to be here, Brian. I'm enjoying the graded tour of the enormous studios here. I don't know how you do it for the money. OK, well, it's value for money. It's value for money. Thank you for those kind words. Uh, we've also got a hidden guest off camera, and that's Alex, who's come down also to join us for a few days. And we'll be doing some interesting work to uh, help expose what the British government is really up to. And of course, we haven't forgotten, we've uh, got Mike Robinson behind the technical desk to ensure a smooth running programme on a budget of less than £3.65 billion. Well, the weather in Scotland is appalling. It was dreadful. It was raining hard when I left, but yesterday was very nice and that was summer. And flight delayed by an hour due to? Due to a sick aircraft. Ah, oh, right. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a Russian bear interfering with flights or anything like that. If it was, it didn't tell us about that. OK. All right. Well, we're really glad you've uh, made it. Uh, we have got some weather reports in. Perthshire apparently is dry, so that's good news. It's clearing up north of the border. Uh, it's cloudy in Glasgow, I think, not too bad in Accrington. So that's most of the country covered. What is the important news? Well, according to the Telegraph, it's the fact that um, uh, the latest scam from electricity providers is to drop the voltage. Um, and we needn't worry, it's not going to destroy your electronic equipment. Uh, all it really means is that your kettle is going to take another 18 seconds longer to boil. I, th I think, David, this is one of the biggest scams we've seen because, of course, people are paying for units of electricity at, at a particular voltage. That's what the contract is about. And this has been a secret trial carried out over quite a large section of the country where that voltage has been dropped. And because people haven't complained, they say, well, we're going to we're going to roll this out. Why are they having to do it? Uh, because of the failure of the uh, wind generation. Yes, I mean, wind generation and all the other renewables uh, have been introduced through a very, very widespread subsidy without uh, any, it would seem, careful planning into, into the implications for the stability of the grid and uh, at the cost of our coal industry as well. Um, so it, it's, uh, it, it bodes badly for the future. We may have to uh, get used to some power cuts and 1970s style living. So here we are in David Cameron's 2015. We can't generate enough electricity. We don't have the engineers to help restore nuclear, uh, the nuclear generation infrastructure. We've got to rely on the Chinese. Remember, they're a hostile nation, uh, but not to worry. They're going to be brought in to look after us and... Uh, and um, you're going to drop the voltage that does have a, an impact on uh, electronics. Mike, I think you've got a few comments here. Well, I mean, David hit the nail on the head there when he mentioned coal, because this is the main reason for the problem. Um, the uh, European Union, of course, requiring that uh, we turn off our coal powered power stations, coal fired power stations, and that's exactly what's happened. Um, so back in the day, if you go back 10 years or so, um, Britain was considered to have uh, a capability of generating 80 gigawatts of electricity uh, with a requirement for 40. Um, and in fact, if you look today, uh, we are currently using um, around 40. Uh, but according to the national grid, we only have a capacity, uh, a, a sort of excess capacity of uh, one or two percent. So this winter, we are likely to see some power cuts. Uh, but you've got to ask, how has the government allowed this to happen? Or has it been a deliberate policy? And am I right in also thinking that we're, of course, connected to the French grid so that uh, as our, our own grid is collapsed, we can buy um, French electricity and pump profit back into the, into the French system? Well, I didn't look today, but yesterday we were um, importing about 5% of our energy requirement from France. Yes. Right. Interesting situation. Britain under David Cameron's Conservatives, 2015, we can't generate enough power to boil our kettles, but trust this government. Are, are we over, overly cynical here, David, or is something really disastrous going on? We, we have something here that's generated by the enormous global warming scam. Uh, we have a situation where some decades ago, 
uh, a story which was originally science fiction. It was the story underpinning Soylent Green, if you want to look at, at the old film, that uh, man's use of fossil fuels uh, would have a warming effect on the planet. Uh, back in the 70s, when the current uh, scientific scare was global cooling, this was viewed as a good thing. But uh, once we had the wall come down and a lot of people coming into the green movement from uh, from left-wing totalitarian and, and absolutist political ideas, it got seized upon for political ends, nothing to do with science, for political ends, uh, to uh, alter how we think and how we behave. And we're seeing the unfortunate consequences roll out. Yeah, well, it's all serious stuff, but it's becoming ever more easy to see that uh, it starts out with a scam and then the policies come in on top of it. Well, one area where we've consistently stayed focused is on the issue of children. Children, of course, not only loved in the, the overwhelming majority of families, but they represent our future. Uh, what you've been talking about over some time is the risk to children in Scotland becoming the property of the state under the named person scheme. Uh, but we picked up on this amazing Daily Mail article here, which says that a Latvian child who was found home alone in a London flat will be adopted in the UK, uh, despite the mother's claims that social services had stolen her daughter. Well, of course, the key headline there is slightly misleading because the substance of this case is that the Latvian government is also not happy as to what's going on here, that the child, a Latvian child, has been taken by British social services. Now, nobody's contesting the circumstances under which the uh, small child was found, appalling home circumstances, and clearly something needed to happen. Uh, but what we've now got is British judges simply passing judgment over what is to happen worldwide. And what's remarkable here is that um, head of the family law division, uh, Judge Mumby, Sir James Mumby, has di dismissed the mother and the Latvian government claim, uh, saying the fact that the law in this country permits adoption in circumstances where it would not be permitted in many European countries is neither here nor there. The number of care cases involving children from other European countries has risen sharply in recent years, and a significant and sorry and significant numbers of care cases now in, involve such children. So this seems to uh, me, David, pretty remarkable stuff because James Mumby is simply saying we, we we don't care whether another nationality is involved or another. Uh, government who are saying we're not happy with this, with what's going on here. We British judges simply decide what's happening with children. This is would this, not be thinking outside of his authority. And not only thinking, thinking I, I'd suggest acting outside of his authority. Mike, uh, this is the same Judge Mumby that went to a foreign embassy. Can't remember which one. Might even have been Latvia recently to discuss this issue. Issue is it not? Uh, this is absolutely correct. Um, thank you for reminding me. Uh, we discovered that uh, there had been a, a nice little secret meeting at the Latvian embassy. Of course, some, uh, some details were uh, released publicly, but nothing of any substance as to what was discussed. But we can tell our audience that Judge Mumby was one of the people who met for a meeting discussing family court issues within the Latvian embassy. Uh, so those present were entitled to know what was being discussed. British public, of course, not entitled to know what was, what was being discussed. So we'd like to call on today's programme for an open declaration by Sir Judge, uh, uh, Sir, uh, Sir Mumby as to what was discussed there in the Latvian embassy. And uh, perhaps that would enlighten us. There has, of course, Brian, been a lot of uh, a lot of concern coming, particularly from Latvia, but from the whole of Eastern Europe, about the way their nationals are being treated by UK social services, which they find to be often outrageous. Yeah, and it's it's something that's going to be a, a political issue in in Eastern Europe. And uh, if only uh, we could see uh, concerns that uh, people have in Britain are actually being raised at a high level. We might get somewhere further. David, I'm still stunned as to, as to why so many people do not seem to pick up on how important this is. They are watching the state taking more and more powers over families and, and children. 
And of course, the moment the state gets control of children, you are in Nazi Germany. Anything is possible from getting rid of children that are sick and diseased and a so-called burden on the state as useless eaters, or you're going to go down the let's get the children involved as um, Hitler youth. And the only thing they're going to be taught is how to support the agenda of the state. That's where it heads, isn't it? A, a little um, clip from uh, events in Scotland today. Yeah. Um, there was a charity in Scotland yesterday called for a single national uniform for all Scottish school children. I don't think I'm very happy with that concept. Well, that's an interesting one. But of course, um, let's just remind people that north of the border, uh, we had this amazing judgment where Robert Green, who had simply been trying to uh, expose child abuse around the Holly Gregg case, uh, remember Robert put in prison twice, out comes uh, a Scottish court with a ruling gagging Robert from speaking about this case anywhere in the world for life. Uh, but the remarkable thing is he's still not got anything in writing about this judgment, has he? No, it's, uh, it, 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 there's nothing in writing and there doesn't appear to be anything forthcoming in writing in the foreseeable future. And uh, Robert was told in court that not only could he not speak out on uh, matters relating to child abuse in Scotland, whilst in Scotland, he couldn't even mm. be safe dis discussing this s privately in his own living room. His barrister said he would advise against it. And he could certainly not talk about it anywhere else on the planet. And this, this was for life. Um, but what has not been provided is any formal documentation to inform Robert of his new and very much more restricted um, package of uh, free speech rights. Yeah. And then, of course, we, if we go to, well, it's as dangerous, but we're going to a different uh, uh, place in the agenda. We've got Plymouth City Council recently don't like what somebody started to say about them on the internet. So they're going to pull that information down using a law which is supposedly to do with communities. Plymouth City Council projects um, uh, issues a community protection notice against website Our Place, Our Base, takes them off air, censors the worldwide internet. Um, and of course, they're being reinforced by their own legal team at the moment. So we, we're, the, just seeing, we're just seeing state gagging coming in everywhere lo we're looking. State gagging and one of the mechanisms is the unequal fight in the courts. The fact that you have l large tax funded groups of lawyers on one side and private individuals who are targeted individually on the other means it's a very unequal struggle. If anyone stands up against the state, mm. they're, they're putting the entire financial well-being, the, the interests of the family uh, at, at risk. They're risking everything. Uh, the state and state officials risk nothing because it's all tax, taxpayer funded. And on that point, in, in the Plymouth City Council case, uh, in the Magistrates Court where we attended, uh, we saw the City Council lawyer almost mocking the mother. So the, the, the case dropped uh, against the, the, the mother from OPOB. So City Council had to back away. They realised they got that one wrong. So the mother then uh, basically said, well, we want, uh, or she want, want, wanted costs for a time in court. And uh, what did Plymouth City Council solicitor immediately come up with? Oh, well, there was basically a set precedence that uh, councils should not be charged costs. So the council uses taxpayers' money to run that action against the website. They drop it against this particular lady. And then when she says, well, wait a minute, I've been arrested. I've had to get child minders in. I've had to do X, Y and Z. The, the arrogance of the Plymouth City Council lawyer, just breathtaking. And he's trying to say to the magistrates, well, I don't think this woman should get £18 an hour. Yes. And the, this assumption, uh, which we see very strongly north of the border as well, the assumption is that our wise overlords are only here to help us and serve us and they really can do no wrong. So it was just an honest mistake that took this woman into court and, and they're all operating in the public good. So why should they ever have to pay for the mistakes? Well, indeed, and, and he admitted in court, the, the solicitor admitted in court that it was a, an evolving law. He was a bit confused as to what the law actually meant. Well, uh, where is this going to go with families? Let's have a look at the Telegraph here because I think this is another classic bit of nudging. The headline is forget the tired single mum stereotype. 
all hail the rise of the new solo mum. And uh, what this is about, according to the Telegraph, is the ease at which women can now uh, have a child, um, all done either on the quiet with a, with a quickie affair or else it's artificial insem insemination. And um, this is not just um, not one or two women, but it's now becoming a lot of women choosing to have a child and they don't want a father involved. Now, I'm just going to put this in before I ask you to reply. But if we look at the agenda of the state at the moment, everything is about breaking up a traditional heterosexual family. Uh, the, the women are being promoted to have a baby here. It's for their convenience. It's nothing to do with thinking, does the child, is the child going to grow up saying, who's my father? They're not, these women are not interested in that. And what they don't realise, because I think these ladies are being played, is that what we've really got going on is a political agenda to pit men and women against each other. And ultimately, the only, the only organisation, the only person that's going to be the father is the state. And you've got a hint of this, I think, north of the border. Yes, the father, the state as father is very much part of the agenda. Essentially, the entire nature of the welfare state puts the state in that position. And it, it removes, to some extent, the traditional role of the, far, of the father as provider for his family. Um, we've also got um, explicitly stated in, um, in the legislation in Scotland that the named person, the state appointed guardian, is to have powers and, and rights which rival those of the parents. So the state in Scotland is explicitly claiming some of the ground normally occupied by loving parents in families. Um, it was very interesting to see that the, the here on the Kay Adams phone-in show on the named person a few weeks ago, the second person to call in uh, pointed the, the programme in the direction of the Communist Manifesto, Chapter 2, entitled Destroy the Family. The, the agenda here has been very explicitly to destroy the family because it is felt by those who, who promote this uh, ideology that the reason the ideology has failed is that the family is the glue that holds society together. So to break society and remake it in, the, in their image to, to comply with their wishes and, and their designs, we must first destroy the family. And that is what we are seeing here. Yeah. Now, if I bring up this, um, uh, well, this is a shot from a website, Family Law. And the reason I've chosen this is that I had an email, first of all, a sort of email that I've had many times before from a father very upset that uh, something has happened in the family and the father cut out from contact with, uh, with his children, his child or his children. And this, this was the basic story in this case. Uh, but it, here the website shows the fact that the, the state is successfully dividing people because this website is highlighting the plight of the fathers. Then we've got other websites which are by mothers saying, well, you know, we are trying to uh, look after ourselves. So the state has absolutely driven a wedge between people. And uh, it was meant to do that. It was meant to create hostility. Um, deliberate policy. You've used the word communist, which I can relate to in as much as we saw this as part of subversion techniques in the Soviet era. But I think we're looking at something much older and deeper. Yes, I mean, the, the state is, is there to divide and loot people. And they need to divide. And that's, that's the basic agenda. It's one of exploitation. It's not one of freedom. It's just couched in terms that we will liberate you from want uh, all you have to give up ultimately is your liberty. But if you give up liberty in order to obtain stuff, ultimately you'll get neither. Yeah. Well, let's um, chop across to the Daily Mail because um, Richard Littlejohn, who's quite highly respected by most people, produced this article, uh, which I would really like to pull apart. Uh, the Mind How You Go Summer Special, ahead of his annual awards, Richard Littlejohn details some of the best examples of police stupidity, overreaction and incompetence. Now, my feeling on this is that Richard Littlejohn simply can't grasp the fact that this bizarre police behaviour that we've got now is, is not stupidity, it's not silliness. This is a result of police being interfered with during their training. 
And UK Column has put out quite a lot about the fact that we've now got police colleges involving common purpose, involving neuro-linguistics. And we've got um, a lady who's chair of the training who's actually a psychologist. Why you need a psychologist to help train police, I don't know. But um, Richard Littlejohn seems to think uh, it's all a joke. Presumably he thinks increasing police brutality is a joke. Yes, I mean, we're seeing that death and custody. Uh, we'll come later on to the Sheku Bayer case in Kirkcaldy. We're seeing it, Tom Crawford's um, experience in the police. We're seeing people who are, who are not responding either in an empathetic or, 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 a, or a human way or in a lawful way. And it's very concerning to see that the, the British police force reduced to that. Yeah. Well, this is um, it's coming in partly on this angle of what, what, how do the police behave these days and how do they react to the public? And, um, well, Alex, it was, uh, it was you who highlighted this story to us this morning. So here's the mail online. And it's talking about Chris Eubank, who um, tried to get involved when a man was, uh, was going to jump off the M23 bridge near Crawley to commit suicide, which he subsequently did. Uh, but basically, the police were there trying to talk to, to the man. The man was black. Chris Eubank Bank saw something was happening, stopped, tried to engage the man by, you know, a bit of bonding. They were both black. And what did the police do? No, no, we don't want you involved, sir. So Mr Eubank is led away, whereupon the police then lose control of the situation and the man jumps and commits suicide. And uh, what somebody said to us is, well, have a look at what the coroner said. So Penelope Schofield, coroner for West Sussex, said the police had acted in a selfless way and had done everything they could to save the man. It is my view that Sussex police should be very proud of the way they acted that night. But of course, there's another message here, which is that if a member of the public um, tries to do what a normal good person would do, help others, show public spirit, then uh, no, 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 the police are there. We know better. Go away, sir. We're going to deal with it. Is that, is that an unkind analysis on this case? It, it, no, it's not unkind. And I, and I think it speaks to, to oh, sorry, a, 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 a wider truth here that uh, in Great Britain, in a common law jurisdiction, uh, we are all meant to be equal under the law. Uh, really, the police shouldn't be able to do anything that every ordinary citizen uh, can do, could do, uh, in order to look after one another, prevent wrongdoing, and generally operate in a lawful and decent manner. Um, splitting off uh, the, the, the main part of the population from any responsibility for their fellow man, professionalising everything, professionalising parenting, professionalising law enforcement, professionalising, maintaining order in our own communities means that most people are excluded, excluded from these activities and uh, the state becomes ever more powerful because whatever power and authority and control that we as individuals lose is hoovered up and collected by the state apparatus. Mm. Well, police training getting strange, we, we've given us snap preview of uh, what was coming up next, which is the green blob from outer space. So we've just talked about Plymouth City Council. Um, they, they've got very excited, of course, that somebody's trying to tell the truth on the internet. Uh, but city, uh, Plymouth as a city is apparently supposed to be really excited that we've got a piece of artwork, which is a green blob from outer space. And um, it's a collaboration. Uh, It'll be a cast and Plymouth School of Created Arts collaboration promoting both organisations and culture. So apparently this represents culture in Plymouth and we've all got to be terribly proud. Well, I'm going to put in this label, depressing, meaningless art. And this is not silly. I don't think what's going on here is silly. I think this is a classic example of playing with people's minds because what is this? It's a meaningless blob. Um, you've got a bit of this sort of stuff in Scotland as well. Well, let me tell you, Brian, if that was in Glasgow, a meaningless blob is not the word they'd have for it, but <laughs> there would be a word for it. 
<laughs> there would be a word. OK, well, we're here broadcasting from Plymouth, England, and, and we'd like to say we're utterly not proud that uh, Plymouth City Council and others are proud to promote depressing, meaningless art. So while the art is being pushed as uh, the important subject, here, have a look at some reality here from The Telegraph. Uh, this is a story saying that we've got British troops uh, training Ukrainians at the moment. Think what that really means. British armed forces overseas training people uh, to get ready to fight the Russians. Uh, but what are these soldiers learning? Well, they're actually learning uh, that, of course, most of their battle experience is against relatively uh, lightly armed foe, uh, whether it's in Iraq or Afghanistan. And suddenly uh, they're dealing with Ukrainians who are saying to them, well, actually, you guys, you need to realise we're up against the Russians and we're now dealing with pretty heavyweight uh, military equipment, tanks, rocket launchers, uh, the whole issue. And um, we're, we're getting the impression that the British Army is suddenly realising, well, we don't have any more equipment. We're not really equipped to fight wars. We're equipped to do a little bit of foreign aid. And uh, Michael Fallon, um, Defence um, Secretary, I've inset there. Um, we know that the British Armed Forces are being taken apart at the moment. We haven't got the equipment. We haven't got the number of vehicles to absorb losses in a major combat area. Um, we're worried about kettles that don't boil and meaningless art. This is pretty serious stuff, what's going on in Eastern Europe. Well, what's going on in Eastern Europe is extremely, extremely concerning. We're seeing here the build-up of friction between what will be a European superstate and what will be an Eastern power. And uh, this, is not, this does not bode well for the, the future peace of humanity at all. And um, I, I'm really at a loss to explain what our government are trying to achieve in this. It doesn't seem like an, an area that Britain has any... Um, traditional interest at all in being involved and let us, let us face facts that our previous engagement in, in the great game, power politics, alliances, it, it's produced some dreadful conflicts and we do not want to go that way again but that does seem to be the direction in which this is heading. Yeah well we'll wait to see how the outcome goes on that so um, what about other wars? No better place to go than the Chilcot inquiry and we're now in the situation that uh, families of um, men and women who died in that conflict are saying we are going, well, they are working on the process of taking Mr. Chilcott to court. Uh, but the paper describing him as a man with no conscience, MP generals and victims families condemn Sir John Chilcott's six year failure to publish findings. Well, it hasn't been a failure, of course, it's been a success because his job has been to make sure it hasn't come out. But um, it was pointed out to us this morning that it's very interestingly interesting that from 1999 to 2004, during the Iraq war, that Chilcott was the nominated staff counsellor to whom people in MI5, MI6 and GCHQ were to go if they had anything that was on their mind that was wrong about the war. So this is quite remarkable information because this man has been put forward as, of course, the independent man to run the inquiry. Um, man of no conscience? Oh, absolutely not, because clearly he was one of the backdoor men to make sure everything was shut down at the time. So would I that, think Would that not make him, Brian, one of the least appropriate people in the entire country to run this inquiry? If you're an honest person, yes, but if you're a member of the British government and you want the cover up, he's the perfect man. It's just turning things on their head. So we remind people, having said that about Mr. Chilcock, that who, of course, is in control of the intelligence services at the moment? Who is in control of investigations into child abuse? Well, it is David Cameron, uh, because MI5's own website points out that uh, David Cameron has overall responsibility for the UK intelligence agency. So uh, if it was Blair that was the supposed target of Chilcott, uh, well, no worries, because David Cameron's going to make sure he's protected. And um, it's just not possible. These people didn't know what was going on with the children. If they'll lie over the children and paedophiles, they're going to lie over, um, they're gonna lie over the, the um, 
creation of an illegal war. Yes, if, you, if you're assaulting uh, huge numbers of children and the most vulnerable children in the country, what's, what's a small conflict really um, bother your conscience beyond that? There comes a point when the evidence stacks up to such an extent that we have to conclude that those who are ruling this country uh, have really shown themselves to be, um, uh, have insufficient moral character to be ruling anything. Low empathy people. Uh, well, just a quick advert, if you still haven't gone onto the UK Column website to have a read of the excellent uh, Ben Fellows article, Regina versus Ben Fellows, uh, written by John Roper. Uh, it's an analysis that we haven't seen anywhere else in the national press or indeed alternative media. But having a look at actually what was and was not said in court and what the real implications are, and the fact that if you analyse the court case, we're left with, we say, some 14 questions that need to be answered over just how the state could put somebody who claimed they were sexually assaulted as a child uh, through a pretty vicious system of police investigations and then charge them with perverting the course of justice. Uh, well done, the jury, for actually seeing through it. So um, on the subject of Ben Fellows and viciousness of the police, um, I think it's north of the border, David, and uh, tell us what's been happening about this investigation into the death of Mr. Bayo. Yes, it, it's striking the difference between the care that is lavished by the authorities on those who are seen as their own. Um, they have a duty of care to everyone they employ. These, this, is, this is used in many cases for taking extreme care, not to, not to put too much pressure on people. And for those who wish to destroy, um, Dr. David Kelly, um, Ben Fellows, uh, and, and, and so many more, Robert Green, for example, the pressure is just mounted without any, any limitation on the amount of... Um, personal toll that might take on these people. Melanie Shaw being the most striking example I can recall of late. Now, what we have here is um, an article um, from um, the Daily Record and it's, it's revealing here that Sir Stephen House, the head of Police Scotland, um, has visited the police officers who were, who were present when Jacob Bale was, was killed on the streets of Kirkcaldy. Um, when, he was, he, when he died in custody. And um, he was uh, talking to them before they'd even spoken to the investigation team who were meant to be getting to the bottom of this. Um, the, he's also failed to give um, any, any attention to the family. And this is, this is more of the article here, yes. is it? Uh, yes, this, this carries on here. This is, this is the, the chap who was killed and his, uh, uh, his partner. And they have a small child together and uh, they look very happy there and happier times and um, the, the family is complaining that, uh, that Sir Stephen House has not had any contact with them, has refused to meet them and uh, has been spending time meeting uh, those that they, they consider to be guilty of, of, of serious wrongdoing that, that led to the death of this man um, and those complaints reached the ears of some local politicians who uh, Scottish nationalist MSPs uh, for the Kirkcaldy area who have been trying to get some meetings arranged with Sir Stephen House. Right, is it, this is House in this picture here? This, this is House, yes. He's, uh, he's looking a little bit, um, he's looking a bit haggard these days, isn't he? The pressure beginning to tell because we've got people calling for this man to stand down. Well, we've got the, the, we've got the official opposition in Scotland calling for him to stand down with immediate effect. Um, Any time we come in contact with Scottish police officers, um, the, the view that the officers on the beat take of Sir Stephen House is extremely negative. I mean, they're very strident in this. He seems to have lost all confidence amongst the, the ordinary beat uh, policemen. And um, one of the main problems is the way he's handled the Shaker Bear case, where uh, a month was allowed to pass, a month before the officers responsible um, present at, at, at this incident were even questioned by a competent authority. It seems to be utterly outrageous. 
and um, there's no attempt to to even justify it or explain it. Yeah, um, David, one one of the things you said to me before start of um, today's news was that the way the that uh, police Scotland are now treating SNP uh, Scottish Parliament members of the Scottish Parliament got there in the end. The way the police are, are treating um, members of the Scottish Parliament. Uh, is sort of the way they were just treating members of the public before. It's like the arrogance is is growing. Yes, I mean the these two MSPs, now the nationalist MSPs, they are um, natural supporters of Police Scotland. Uh, they they approached Sir Stephen House and wanted a meeting, where Sir Stephen would come and meet the MP, Mr. Mullen, and the family uh, of of the deceased. Uh, three weeks passed, and. Um, so Stephen House didn't think this uh, matter was worthy of a personal response. He delegated the response uh, to a junior officer, a more junior officer. And uh, the response came back, it was very short and it was incoherent. So much so that the MSP concluded that they had un been un Police Scotland had been unable to understand the short letter that he had sent in requesting a meeting. So it's an extremely poor situation. The MSPs obviously uh, have more clout than the rest of us and they have demanded and will get a meeting with the Minister, uh, Mr Matheson, to discuss this matter more fully. Um, but they're very unhappy about the way they've been treated. And I would have to say that this has been, uh, well, working on the Robert Green, Holly Gregg case, this has been the daily diet of dismissal we've got from Scottish authorities. Nothing's ever answered. Nothing's ever honest, nothing's ever open. It's just dismissal, 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 and delay, delay, delay. That's that's the reality of it. That's how they treat people. Yeah. Well, we're just going to interject there with um, an, an article. Well, it's BBC. Apologise for that. But they were reporting that uh, John Burko had been saying that the SNP MPs were good parliamentarians. Um, they turn up in large numbers, they turn up very regularly, they turn up to support each other, and a lot of them are already proving to be very good parliamentarians. What it seems to me is describing is, is a group acting as a uniform block of people. Um, is, this, is this what being a good parliamentarian is about, that you turn up in a block and vote in a block? Or am well, I that's, missing that's this? certainly the mindset on display here, that this is groupthink, it's, it's, um, that there is something inherently a collectivist about the way the SNP operate. Uh, internal dissent, we may be going to see a little bit over the Shaker Bale case, but internal dissent is generally missing and they will operate as, as a collective. Yeah. Well, I did, I did actually have a, a couple of bits of material. This, this was some of the reports from Commons, uh, sorry, commonspace.scot, which is about this criticism of the police investigation. Um, what have we got here? I think we can just blow this bit up a bit. Um, here we are. I find it unacceptable that Police Scotland have taken so long to respond to an urgent request from me for a meeting regarding their dealings with the Big Bayo family. I think the fact they sent a letter of so-called explanation that suggests they have an inability to read the short-term letter I sent them in the first place is not encouraging. That's a very polite language. And it adds to the sense that this is being very badly managed by the police. We've and got that, a death. This is not. This is not somebody you know had a had a bit of trouble with the police. This is somebody dying in custody. Yes, someone yeah. someone dying in custody and then dying in custody with a very suspicious situation surrounding it, whereby there's a suggestion that this was some sort of or was treated as some sort of terrorist incident when it was not. It was treated as a wife uh, knife wielding maniac when there was no knife. Um, the man was described as enormously large and strong when he was of average build. And uh, there seems to be uh, five stories in the first seven hours were given to the family. So there's a lot of things to be, to be concerned about. You then have a month delay uh, for everyone concerned to get their so stories straight before any investigation starts. And you're left feeling that we are not seeing justice. Yeah. And somebody else who uh, has felt for many years that there is no just justice in Scotland is Anne Gregg, mother of Holly Gregg. And uh, we have this letter here. We thought it was an appropriate time to bring this up. It's a letter from Anne Gregg to Alex Salmon. 
what is this about? It's about the fact there is no justice in Scotland. Uh, I think I can just uh, br um, enlarge it a little bit, but you'll take us through it, David. Yes, uh, it, it's a very plaintive letter. You can you can tell the the desperation that, that's that's under underlying this um, that comes from. Uh, so much effort uh, being uh, rejected and so, ma so many pleas being, being left unanswered. It reads, uh, Dear Mr Salmond, I received a letter today from Mr Stephen Smith. He is not the First Minister of Scotland, is he? I wrote to you, the First Minister, to answer my question. That, incidentally, is, is standard practice. We see that all the time. I had to leave Scotland with my Down syndrome daughter because of corruption in the legal system. She was sexually abused by a network um, all my family's money was stolen by corrupt lawyers. I've got evidence to prove this, but where do I go to get justice? There's something radically wrong with the system. I'm writing to you, the First Minister. When, um, when I go to the law in England, they tell me to go to the law in Scotland. The law in Scotland uh, hides behind each other, so please tell me, as First Minister, where do I go? Um, in a 56, uh, I'm a 56-year-old 50, carer for my traumatised daughter who suffers panic attacks because of the abuse. I need my family's money to look after her. I'm living on carer's allowance because of the corruption. My mother, father, brother and myself all worked hard to accumulate her wealth, yet these idle parasite lawyers manipulate and corrupt the laws to hide their theft. So I'm, asked, I'm asking you again, where do I go to get justice? Now, frankly, um, as, a, as, as a sheer matter of, of personal quality, I would suggest that that letter deserved uh, a personal response from the First Minister. Sadly, it didn't get it. No. And we should uh, remind people that, of course, in trying to speak out and protect her daughter, Anne Gregg, like many other mothers and fathers, ended up in a psychiatric unit uh, attempts were made to put um, Robert Green through that process as well. So corruption in the courts, we've got judges within the family law division spelling out the law to overseas countries, uh, mighty powerful people. And if you challenge them, you're in danger of being put in, into a psychiatric unit. Not uh, Stalinist Russia, but David Cameron's Britain in 2015. Uh, the firm here has had a few things to, to talk about, uh, to say about justice. This goes back to um, um, Ms. Angelini, former procurator fiscal, and whether she was involved at certain stages of the Holly Gregg case. Um, this bit here, the Lord Advocate declined to comment. The Crown Office communications manager told the firm that Angelini was not the regional procurator fiscal when the decision was made. Uh, but added they had yet to check when a decision was taken not to prosecute by whom and on what grounds. Now, this is very interesting. Um, I think this is tiptoeing around the truth. Uh, that would be lying, of course, but uh, uh, the facts of the case are the 25th of August 2000 was when the first report of, of abuse um, was made concerning um, Holly's father. Um, at that point, Angelini indeed was not in post. Um, she became um, Procurator Fiscal in Aberdeen on the 21st of July 2000. Um, but she was in post then when um, Holly named other abusers in uh, August of 2000. Uh, so these other abusers included uh, obviously a sheriff, a senior police officer, and uh, a head a school teacher. Uh, now, a head school teacher. Now, it seems, I think, in, inescapable to conclude that with those uh, allegations being made, that the new Procurator Fiscal would know, would be told, um, and yet we seem to be asked to believe that she didn't know. And we're, we're certainly the Crown Office is stating that she wasn't even in post. That's not true. This is just one of many, many inconsistencies in the government response to the questions raised by the Holly Grant case. Yeah, it's very murky waters. Uh, are we seeing the Scottish government telling the truth? We don't think so. Westminster government telling the truth? Certainly not. 
And uh, of course, are we dealing with a free press? Well, let's remember that uh, Mr. Leveson uh, was working extremely hard to get the British press and media under control on the basis of phone hacking. And we're going to remind our audience once again that, uh, of course, uh, private emails from myself somehow turned up in the troll bundle uh, connected to the Eilish Angelini case. Uh, how did that happen? If we just put this one on screen. Thank you, Mike. Um, so um, this is the mail talking about blue chip phone hacking, legal and insurance firms behind 80 percent of the snooping. Well, I don't see any reason why le uh, why insurance firms will be after my emails. But uh, what about legal firms? Um, well, we're asking Mr. Leveson, how did one of my personal emails end up in that court case with Eilish Angelini? Um, you think you might have a bit of an answer here? Um, with, well, um, yes. Th this is this is the the situation again reported by the firm, uh, who have been excellent and almost alone in reporting some of the concerns over the Scottish legal system. Um, that the panel, which advised Alex Salmond on implementing the Leveson recommendations, um, contained none other than one Peter Watson, um, Alex Salmond's uh, lawyer, uh, Elise Angelini's lawyer. Um, then of Levy and McRae, and I think Brian, someone who threatened the UK column at one point over your um, original publication yeah. of the Holly Gregg story. Yeah, yeah he yeah. he was on the phone pretty uh, quickly to tell us we'd better get that material down or else. I mean, you know, we took we took it as a threat. We thought it was harassment, mm -hmm. uh, but we didn't take the article down. And look where that's led us. Interesting, isn't it? So this is the comment here um, that he was uh, busy. And of course, Mr. Watson, if I remember correctly, also uh, linked to the demise of Heather Capital. Um, yes, uh, uh, that's still going on. There's still a £400 million uh, fraud investigation and uh, private civil lawsuit uh, concerning Levy and McRae and Peter Watson uh, that's, uh, that's ongoing at the moment. And I'm sure we'll yeah. hear more about that later. OK, well, we'll end on the... The subject of um, Eilish Angelina, of course, this was the lady who eventually moved on to advise the Metropolitan Police how they should deal with, uh, uh, how they could deal better with rape victims and people claiming they've been sexually abused. Um, but uh, the firm here asking whether the Lord Advocate spent more on defending her reputation than uh, Holly Gregg. Yes. So what happened here is Elise Angelini was procurator fiscal when the majority of the allegations raised by Holly Gregg came to light. Um, short while after that, Anne was essentially assaulted, um, forcibly sedated and woke up in uh, Cornhill Mental Hospital um, having been sectioned and the reason she was sectioned was she was supporting Holly in um, raising the, the allegations with the appropriate authorities. Um, this was viewed uh, by many people as uh, evidence that Angelini as the person ultimately responsible for prosecution decisions in the area um, had some explaining to do. Uh, rather than explaining anything, rather than trying to justify a position, rather than putting any information into the public domain, what instead happened was um, public funds were used to threaten many, many, it would appear, uh, press and media outlets. Uh, not only yourself, Brian, and the firm. The firm came under very heavy pressure and another legal magazine called The Drum, but also mainstream media outlets and newspapers. Um, mm -hmm. We know that this um, pressure was applied by Peter Watson and Levy and McRae. We know that the bills for um, uh, Peter Watson and Levy and McRae some or all were paid for by the UK taxpayer uh, through the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service. What we don't know is exactly what was done. We don't know exactly what money was spent. We don't know how much money was spent. Um, and we don't know exactly what on. And we've been blocked from finding out that out. Uh, there's a wonderful quote here as to why we're not allowed to know that, because to know that information would prejudice substantially the prevention and detection of crime. OK. Uh, I don't understand that. Well, we just put up the comment from the firm. This is one of the articles. People can see this themselves. And they're talking about another um, uh, legal uh, 
commentating magazine, The Drum. The Drum asks if Scottish government financed the defamation action against the media. So we're into interesting times. We've got local councils like Plymouth City Council trying to hide what has actually gone in the got on in the council you shut down free speech on the internet that's what Plymouth City Council blatantly trying to do uh, we've got the government hiding unlawful wars in Iraq Chilcott doing his job I'm going to say doing a very good job he stalled it for six years he's still doing the job that was required of him so the British government wherever you look cover up the crime uh, hide the crime and if you try and resist and you ask too many questions, then you'll either be jailed for harassment or... Perverting the course of justice. Or you will be bankrupted via un un unlimited legal fees where you are up against the entire financial might of the UK state. Well, we're not going to leave you on that precise comment because that would be an unfair thing to do. What we're going to say is that's the reality. Of course, can we stand up against it? We can, provided people stick together, people work together as teams. And when people are victimised, the wider public stands up and shouts about it. Where that has happened, be it over Holly Gregg or Melanie Shaw or Tom Crawford or indeed Ben Fellows, where the wider public has said, no, we're not having this, and people are starting to uh, speak out uh, in a unified voice, then we see the state shrink back. Ultimately, it doesn't matter who these people are, Eric Pickles, Blair, Brown, Cameron, uh, Mr Chilcott himself, the moment the public shows that they are united in their anger, uh, these people are utterly terrified. So we don't need violence, we don't need... Um, unpleasantness on the streets what we need is the British public to start to really wake up and be counted and to be shouting out loud and clear uh, we are not accepting this and we're going to end on that note thank you for joining us David thank you uh, remember UK column is off for the next two weeks we will be back August the 31st yes we know that's a bank holiday but Mike Robinson running a particularly strict regime here in the UK column. So we have to be back in on a bank holiday. Uh, Alex, thank you very much for joining us as well. And thank you to everybody who's continuing to support UK column and supply us with information. Of course, if you like what we're doing, please consider a subscription or a donation. That's it from us. We will see you 31st of August. Bye bye.